Okay, we're uh, ready to get started. Almost. Uh, welcome to Lockpicking Forensics. Uh, my name is Datagram, uh, also known as DG. Uh, I run the following two sites. Uh, that's my email if you want to contact me about this. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, a real quick um, how locks and picking works. We're going to look at what normal wear on uh, locks and keys looks like. Uh, and then we're going to go into examining locks and keys for uh, different, uh, different evidence of entry uh, based on various techniques. Uh, one thing uh, we want to talk about first is that uh, destructive entry is, is, uh, destructive entry is still something that's uh, the most popular method of entry by far. Uh, it's also the easiest, usually the cheapest, and the fastest. Uh, the, this talk is not going to cover destructive entry, only because uh, from the forensic side of it, it's not as, as interesting as, as other forms of entry, namely lock picking, bumping, so on. And uh, so just, just keep that in mind. On the, the website that I, that I run, there's more information on that if you're interested. So how many of you know how locks and picking works? Just quick show of hands. Would the rest of you like a quick introduction or? No? <laughs> all right, all right, very quickly. Uh, so this is called a pin tumbler lock. The inner piece right here is called the plug. The outer piece is called the cylinder or the shell. Uh, that's how it looks like from the outside. And most people, probably everybody in the United States, uh, has these on their, their, their work, their home, their garage, everything. Uh, the way these work is that inside the lock, there are two pins. And the bottom, ki the bottom pin is called the key pin. The top pin is called the driver pin. Above those two, there's a spring. So when you, when you try and just turn that inner piece, the plug, the piece that rotates when you use the key, you're blocked by those blue pins. The blue pins are preventing you from rotating that inner piece, which then engages the, the bolt or, or the shackle or whatever you have in, in your lock. So what a key does is it raises all these pin pairs to the correct position so that the, the red and blue top and bottom key and driver pins, they can separate. And that allows you to rotate that bottom piece. So essentially when this happens, the key raises it, the blue pins are trapped up in the cylinder, the red pins are, are properly aligned. The point where, they're meet, where they meet right here is called the shear line. So here's just a quick animation of how it works. And that's all that happens when you're using your key on these pin tumbler locks. So the way picking works is that uh, we might assume that when these, these chambers for each pin are drilled and the pins themselves are all uh, perfect alignment, perfect size, uh, they all match. And so when you would turn that inner piece, the plug, we'd be hitting up against all of them at once. We'd be blocked by all of the blue pins at once. And in reality, what happens is that everything's a little off. The, the placement of the chambers, the size of the chambers, the shape of the chambers, the size of the pins, the place, uh, excuse me, the uh, shape of the pins, uh, they're all slightly different. And that leads to uh, these, the effect of when you turn that inner piece, you're only actually hitting one of those pin stacks first. Now, obviously, they all need to be moved by the key to prevent rotation completely, but uh, at any given time, you're only being blocked by one, in theory at least. So the way we pick a lock is we uh, use a special tool. How many of you bought pick sets in the, in the village? Awesome, awesome. They were great pick sets this year. Um, they also didn't cost a million dollars, which was nice. Uh, so the way we pick a lock is we use this tension tool, and we apply tension to the plug. Now when we do that, we're obviously being blocked by those top pins. What we're going to do is we're going to find that one pin stack that is, is blocking us, and we're going to use a pick tool to raise those pin pairs in the same way that a key does. When we do that, uh, the top pin will set. Just like when we use a, a key, it'll be raised to that point where they're allowed to split. We do this, uh, the lock will rotate a very little bit, and then another pin stack will bind. And we do this uh, consecutively until all the pin stacks have been properly aligned, and at that point, the, the plug is allowed to rotate and engage the bolt work. So here's a quick uh, animation of how it works. Again, we use our, our tension tool. We apply light tension. We come in with a pick. And so what the, the animation is doing is he's probing. And you, he's trying to find the binding pin. And the binding pin will be one that has uh, more tension or it'll feel harder to push up. So that one was the binding pin. So he sets that. And so now that pin's trapped above in the cylinder. And he's going and trying to find the next binding pin. So process of elimination, now this one is. So he sets that one. 
and now the second one, and now the last pin. And at that point, that inner piece is free to rotate, and the lock opens. Okay? Has everybody got that? It's, it's. All right, all right. Let's try to get a grip. So this idea of forensic locksmithing is uh, a lot of times we, we give talks almost every year. There, there's at least one lock picking or physical security related talk. Uh, a lot of times we talk and focus only on the techniques to, to compromise locks, compromise safes, and so on. Uh, we never really talk about whether or not that's detectable. And uh, in the last talk, we saw some examples where it wasn't detectable because they were basically using just a normal key. Um, so in 1976, a gentleman named Art Bahoki of the Chicago Police Department, I believe he's in the criminology department at the time, he decided uh, that with his knowledge of locksmithing and investigative work, he was going to do all these different tests against locks uh, in terms of different opening techniques and then examine them uh, for different types of forensic evidence. And he basically uh, started this idea of forensic locksmithing. Unfortunately, a lot of his original research material is not available. And when I found out about forensic locksmithing and I tried to, to get more information, it was extremely hard. And that's why you're, you're watching this talk now. It's basically the results of, of uh, me replicating the original tests. So there, there are a few resources. Uh, the first resource, which is probably the best English resource on the subject, uh, with the exception of my site, is a, a book called... <laughs> I get, well, I, no, no, the book is actually much more detailed than I could ever be on the site, but again, to buy books costs money, of course. So uh, Mark Tobias, who gave the 11 o'clock uh, talk with Tobias, uh, I know I'm going to ruin his name. I'm, I apologize if he's in the audience, uh, Blues Manis. Uh, Tobi Mark Tobias wrote this book, and it's basically this giant tomb of locksmithing uh, information. There's a section on forensic locksmithing, and it's extremely detailed. Um, the book itself is, is somewhat expensive as far as books go, um, but I believe you could buy just these chapters for uh, 50 bucks. I'm not sure. You'd have to check the website. Uh, another resource is uh, written in German uh, by the gentleman who's, again, another name I can't pronounce. Uh, what that translates to is tool traces. And as far as I know, it's the only book that specifically and only focuses on uh, forensic locksmithing. Unfortunately, it's in German, so I haven't read it. Um, however, it does have extremely nice pictures, which put mine to shame, uh, because he uses very, very nice microscope setup. Uh, another one that's in both English and German is this book called Impressioning. Uh, the English translation is, is kind of, uh, it's kind of Englishy. Um, but it's still a very good book, and the person who wrote the German uh, Tool Traces book wrote the section on, in that book about the forensics of impressioning techniques specifically. So what does a, a forensic locksmith do? Uh, they're also referred to as investigative locksmith. The primary goal of the forensic locksmith is to determine if an attempt or success or both was made to compromise, compromise a lock or keying system and uh, identify any tool marks, any trace evidence, anything that can help uh, determine the facts of the case, either by identifying suspects, identifying victims, linking things together, so on and so forth. Uh, they might also provide expert testimony, either as for the defense or for the pros prosecution, uh, on their findings. A lot of times they're also asked to uh, provide testimony uh, just uh, as a... Uh, what do they call it, like a, an independent witness where they just explain things. Because locks and safes are not something that most people know about, so judge and jury, uh, in many cases, need that explained to them or clarified uh, just so that they can have the facts about what is possible, what is not possible, the difficulty of doing different things, so on and so forth. But that, that's basically what a forensic locksmith does. So we're going to look at uh, how different levels of wear affect the components in the lock. Obviously, if we don't know what wear looks like, we can't distinguish it from all the different tool marks and, and different kinds of evidence. So here is a picture. Uh, and in all the, the examples, all the components are brass, pin tumbler locks. That's the most common uh, in this country. There's obviously different types of, of materials that they could use for both tools as well as locks. Uh, the forensic evidence is still very similar. Uh, wear, again, may be a little different depending on the type of lock and the components. But this is by far the most common. Excuse me. So in this photo, we have a picture of a bottom pin from our pin tumbler lock. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that there's uh, 
all these milling marks. We don't see any scratches, we don't see any dents, we don't see any dirt, debris. It looks, uh, for the most part, new, right? The key itself also looks new. Uh, depending on where, you get, where you're getting your key made, this is a, a factory original key. It's not as smooth and nice as the pins, uh, but then again, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be because keys can be replaced easily, but the components inside the lock, uh, that's another story. The plug, that inner piece that rotates, also looks new. No scratches, no dents, nothing like that. After 100 uses, the pin starts to develop this, uh, this light, dark ring and a couple scratches on it. If we look at it up close, what that's doing is that the insertion and removal of the key is actually polishing the bottom of those pins. And the reason that it's around the entire surface of the bottom of the pin is because as you're inserting and removing your key, you're actually rotating those pins. Uh, in the majority of pin tumbler locks, there's nothing to prevent you from continually rotating, rotating it, and there's also no reason. The plug itself, uh, as we're turning it, the top pins are riding along it, and those will cause a, a slight bit of wear. The key itself is also going to start to develop these, uh, these slight crevices where it's rolling along the pin tumblers. After, oh, and I always mention this because it makes me feel better about the time I, I spent doing this, but I did all these by hand, not with a cool machine, so just so you know. <laughs> Thank you for that justification. Uh, I was, this is not a joke, I literally sat down and counted. <laughs> And believe it or not, 15-year-olds with the promise of $50 still find this not in their league. <laughs> no, 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 no miscounts. Perfection. Okay, I, I don't want to... We'll, we'll laugh about it later, and I'll cry about it even later. So after 1,500 uses, uh, the pin one, the pin furthest to the... Or furthest, closest to the front of the lock will have the most wear. It'll almost look completely polished. We'll see some light scratches caused by the imperfections and the wear on the key, but for the most part, all those milling marks are starting to disappear. Uh, pin 5 is a different story. Pin 5 is the pin furthest back in the lock. And this, as you can see, does not have as much wear, and it has more scratches. So why is that? Well, first of all, when you're inserting, inserting your key, pin 1 is touching every part of the key. And the key is also uh, only touching the tip of pin 5. So you think of your key, if it's all the way in the back, it's only getting touched by a very limited portion of the key. So that's going to reduce the wear. Uh, because the, key, the tip of the key is also touching all the pins, it's the most worn down part of the key for the most part. And that's why there's more scratches on here because of the imperfections in the key. At 1500 uses, the key also, again, shows more wear. Well, the black is lubricant from inserting and removing the key so much. Uh, again, the, the craters are just getting bigger and more deformed. Over time, uh, what's going to happen, how many of you have ever used a lock and you had to jiggle it or, or slightly uh, pull it out to work? So that's the key wearing down. So what's happening is the material on the key is going down or the pins are getting smaller, and so you have to jiggle them to make sure those pins can separate properly again. At 1,500 uses, the plug also has uh, increased signs of wear, more staggering of the lubricant. At 5,000 uses, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, at 5,000 uses, uh, pin 1 is almost completely polished. Even the scratches that we saw previously are all but gone now. Um, and after 5,000, I, I decided to be nice to myself. Uh, after 5,000, wear looks pretty similar to this. Uh, it, it gets a little more polished, but for the most part, that's how it looks until the lock stops functioning. Pin 5, again, the same pin we saw previously. Uh, reduced wear compared to pin 1, we also see this funky oval shape. It's not an evenly distributed wear like it is with, with uh, pin 1. The reason for that, again, it's only getting touched by the tip of the key. So when we insert and remove the key, we're not getting the full range of rotation that all the rest of the pins get. And so it starts to develop a, an oval shape in, in different, pins different pin designs. It might also be a figure 8 looking shape. Uh, but it's different, and that may be important if we get a bag of pins as a forensic locksmith and we need to determine which is which, or hopefully determine which is which. 5,000 uses, again, the plug wears down. Something we haven't looked at yet. Uh, how many of you have, have seen bumping, done bumping, know about bumping? So you know that it causes slight damage to the face of the lock. So how does normal wear compare with that? Well, normal wear, I'm sure uh, all of you have done this this weekend, but everyone gets drunk or just too sleepy or too tired and slightly misses the keyhole, right? 
and you make, you make a little scratch. So after 5,000 uses, uh, you make a lot of scratches, a lot of wear. And at the top of the keyway, you're also, most uh, pin tumbler locks are shoulder stopped, which means that that little piece on the key is called the shoulder, is what prevents you from going in further, and that aligns the, the cuts correctly so that they could raise the pins correctly and you could open your lock. 5,000 uses, that's gonna be slightly worn down, but it, it's different than bumping, which is what we'll see in a bit. 5,000 uses again, the key starts to wear down more and more. The, eventually, again, those will not properly align the pin tumblers. So what do we do when we, when we for, forensically analyze, that sounds retarded, but go with me here. Forensic, when we do forensic analysis on the, on the components of the lock, well, we're gonna look at the components. Obviously, we're gonna look at the pins, the springs, and other types of locks. We'll look at whatever components they have. Uh, we're going to look at the plug, the inner piece, the cylinder, the outer piece, the cam or the actuator is that piece on the back that interfaces with the bolt work. That's obviously very important. We're also going to look at all the keys we can get our hands on. Uh, we're going to look at the bolt mechanism itself because that may be subject to attack. Uh, we're also, uh, which is something we don't cover in this talk because we don't have time, we're also going to look at doors, windows, walls, everything that could possibly allow somebody to gain entry to either a residence or a business or facility, so on. So the first thing we're going to look at is lock picking. And how many of you picked a lock this weekend? Very good. I applaud all of you. So what you're doing, <laughs> thank you for that smattering of applause, sir. Uh, what we're doing when we're picking a lock is we're invasively manipulating the components of the lock with a hardened steel tool. And the tool almost in all cases has to be a hardened steel tool so that it's strong enough to lift those pins against spring pressure. So when we do this, we're leaving marks in various parts of the lock, and all the red marks are where we expect to find locks. We'll just jump right into it, save time. So the pins themselves uh, were, of course, were rubbing a steel tool or lifting with a steel tool these soft brass components. That's going to leave a lot of scratches on the pins. The next five pictures are from a five-pin uh, lock that's been picked once. Okay. So even, even one slide of the pick through the lock is going to leave marks in the vast majority of cases. So in this picture we see uh, lots of different scratches in different positions, different angles, different um, depth of the scratches themselves. In this one we see more different places, obviously kind of a similar pattern. Here we see, uh, again similar, but we see these two very large uh, impressions on the pin. So when we talk about lock picking in the villages, we always demonstrate that there's a method of single pin picking, which is what we saw in the animation. There's also raking, where you very uh, quickly scrub the pins of the locks to raise them to a lot of different heights. The long, uh, elongated scratches are, uh, of course, raking. They may also be just single pin picking when you're trying to maneuver in the lock. But something like this is very clearly a, a single pin lifting. And what they may have done is use too much tension, and that's why it required that much force to lift it. Uh, this is, again, slightly less, but we still see marks. They probably picked this pin very quickly. Um, and again, you see the big, long scratch in the center. Uh, this is pin five. Again, not only does it have less wear than the rest, uh, but we see there's very distinct uh, markings on the pin, only a few. So this is almost certainly something that was single pin picked, unless they got very lucky and happened to rake it with the very tip of the pick. Sometimes uh, we can determine the skill level of an attacker. <laughs> based on uh, how the, the marks look. It, it's not always uh, a surefire thing because, of course, an expert lock picker can always pretend to be an amateur after they're finished to uh, dissuade investigators. But something like this is, is uh, basically a horror show in, in terms of forensics. So you see there's very, very deep scratches. Uh, to me, this would indicate they applied extreme tension and that's why they're scraping off so much of this material. Because under normal circumstances, you wouldn't be able to scrape off this much because the pins would raise by the springs. So this is just something I thought I'd, I'd include. Well, what about if you have an expert attacker who's very good at maneuvering the pick, knows exactly what they're doing, uh, can set each pin stack once they know it's binding immediately just by lifting very slowly. Well, this is a, a picture from a, a lock that was picked by an expert. Uh, it's really hard to gauge what expert means in terms of lock picking. Uh, but you can see we still see these scratches. They're, of course, light, but there are still scratches uh, along both the sides and the bottom of the pin. The sides of the pin are something that are extremely hard not to touch 
uh, when you're picking a pin tumbler, especially in the case where if you consider you have a very low pin next to a very high pin, it's extremely hard to raise the very high pin without touching the very low pin. So here we see some scratches on the side. Again, none of this is consistent with normal wear, both in terms of what it looks like, as well as the angles of these tool marks, uh, the, the, the depth of these tool marks. Uh, here's some more examples, light scratching. Here's even extremely long scratches. So the question uh, I get a lot is, well, could this be caused by the key? Well, we saw what uh, normal wear looks like with a normal key. Could be Obviously, we could have a broken or uh, poorly made key that makes different kinds of marks. Every situation is obviously unique, so you need to, to consider all that. Um, but something like this can almost never be caused by the, by the key because we have uh, full length scratches along the side of the pin and the key really only touches the, the bottom and the very, very edge of the, of the bottom of the pin. Uh, again, here's another example of someone who wasn't as skilled. You can see the marks are much deeper. Uh, they're more numerous. The plug itself, that inner piece, is actually a great source of uh, forensic evidence. So if you consider when you're, when you're manipulating these, these uh, pins, you're also scraping against the sides of the plug. The top of the plug, uh, top of the keyway, is something that the key never touches, ideally. Uh, some locks are very tight tolerance, uh, but the majority of pin tumble locks will never touch this area at the top of the keyway. So if we look here, we can see some scratches, and generally this is thought of as uh, virgin territory, which I'm sure is something you guys know a lot about. But we see that there's scratches, and so in that play, in that position, we, we normally would not expect to find something. So that may be a very good indicator that something was picked uh, based on the markings in that location. The walls of the plug are, again, excellent. How many of you have had trouble maneuvering in a very tight keyway with, uh, with your pick tool? Again, that's going to leave a lot of scratches. The scratch is going to be probably at various angles, various lengths. They're not going to be consistent with the use of the key. In the pin chambers themselves, this is a, a plug cut in half. And so that's why we can see all this very well. Uh, in the pin chambers themselves, we might find deformities. So again, this isn't something that a pin would do or a key would do. Otherwise, it would probably do it to more than one chamber, and we'd be able to detect the, uh, the problem on, by examining the key. Again, here's another example. But I like this example because it's actually extremely, uh, an extremely good tool mark in terms of we can see that the angle is not consistent with the key, the placement, as well as the, the depth. And if we look back at this slide, we see it's not on the other one. So let's say a key was doing that. That's one of the wards in the key that prevents the incorrect profile key from going in. We, could, we would probably see if the key maybe had a little bit extra material and they forced it in, we'd probably see that on others as well, not just a random ward in the middle of the plug. Again, up in the pin chambers, we might find more. With very high pins, this is more common, only because you have to lift much higher. Uh, and again, the key does this normally, but with the pick, uh, we can go even higher than the key allows us and get even further. The tension tool that we use at the bottom or the top of the keyway is also going to leave a mark. Uh, here, this one, I did not even have to disassemble it. And we can see there's this nice, fresh line, and that is the tool mark. So how many of you, uh, when you put your tension tool in, you, you kind of have to seat it right? It's not perfectly seated when you first do it. You've got to jiggle it to get it in place. Everybody who's picked a lock probably, right? So when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're essentially making these tiny little scratches. And when you finally choose the, the placement of the tool, you're making this very long uh, uh, scratch. Well, I, I, it's not a scratch because obviously you're shearing into the, into the material, but it looks like a scratch here. And so another thing is that, well, uh, more advanced lock pickers will use lighter tension because that's all that's required. So even in this case where very light tension was used, we hit it with light in the right position, we could see this nice big uh, tension tool mark. We also see those same scratches where they were seating the, the tension tool. The cam, the, the piece in the back of the lock, excuse me, uh, is also going to have scratches. Uh, this is more of an amateur thing, again, because if you're touching the cam of the lock and there's no bypass method, which we'll, we'll get into a little later, then you're essentially not touching any of the pin tumblers and you're just scraping something. Uh, so a lot of times at the conferences, we'll have uh, locks without the cams because they don't serve its purpose because everything's disassembled and there's no bolt work. 
Uh, again, we can really often tell the skill level an attacker by looking at this component as well. A lot of times in the villages, what we'll see is people with the back of the pick or the tip of the pick sticking out the back of the lock, and they're trying to trying to manipulate things, but they're not really touching anything with with the pick tip itself. So when the cam is there, uh, they're going to scratch it up quite a bit doing that, and that's going to leave us very good uh, tool marks. Uh, in a lot of cases with situations like this, we hope that the material from the cam or the, the pins or whatever got onto their tools. And we're hoping that their tool material got into the lock. And later, uh, uh, a different type of forensic analyst will probably go through there and determine what, those compo what that material was. And with a bit of luck, we could even link it back to, to a suspect's tools or a specific lock and so on and so forth. Now, there's a lot of, in recent years, we haven't really been finding these really giant classes of attack, but we've been finding specific tools made for specific locks. And each of those, in the, the majority of cases, will leave distinct forensic evidence. So uh, I believe it was two, two years ago at DEF CON, uh, John King uh, demoed his Metacoder, which is a tool to properly rotate these pins. In a Medico, you need to both raise and rotate the pins properly, so that adds an extra, an extra element of difficulty for picking as well as various other things. Um, so his tool worked very well to pick these locks. But again, we see these scratches in this channel, which is somewhere the key can never touch. And it's somewhere, if you know what a Medico is, the sidebar will also never touch the very bottom of this. Uh, and we're seeing the tools from that, <laughs> seeing the tool marks from that tool. So how many of you know what pick guns are? OK, cool. How many of you know what bumping is? All right, if you know what bumping is, you know what pick guns are. Pick guns are basically bumping with a, a, a specially made little gun thing. And I had one in the village that was uh, broken, but that's what it looks like. It's basically a little gun with a pick at the end of it, and it slaps all those tumblers in the same way that when you bump a lock, you're hitting all those tumblers with a key. Same principle. Uh, we're going to expect to find uh, various different types of marks, obviously on the cam, the pins themselves, uh, because it's essentially just a, a pick with a, a snapping motion at the end. We're going to find most of the same marks. However, they do look different than traditional lock picking. Uh, with the pick gun, unlike bump keys, you do need a, a separate tension tool. So again, we can find the, the same tension tool marks in the front, either at the top or the bottom of the keyway. So pick guns, uh, essentially they just slap the, the bottoms of the pin tumblers to uh, ineffectively, uh, ineffectively, effectively bump the lock. And so when this happens, uh, they're leaving these nice little dents on the, the bottoms of the pins. And when you do this repeatedly, the pins are again allowed to rotate, and they'll start to resemble this bicycle spoke pattern. So with this, not only can we count how many times uh, they, they used the pick gun in the lock, but hopefully some material transferred to their key uh, or excuse me, to their pick gun, hopefully some of the pick gun material transferred to the lock, and again, we could try and identify or, or uh, connect a suspect to, to this situation. On the cam of the lock, uh, we're also going to find these scratches, and these are kind of neat because, again, we could count how many there are, but the cam is also going to allow you to take off quite a bit of material if you're hitting with the tip of that pick gun, it's going to scrape off quite a bit, and those are very distinct tool marks. Uh, again, we're going to hope for something to transfer between the tools for identification later. So, everybody got it? Who's going to get it? Okay. So key bumping is kind of this thing uh, started in 2004 by by Tool of of Netherlands. They're they're hopefully here somewhere <laughs> criticizing me and making notes for me to make this better later. Uh, and in the U.S., Mark Tobias, uh, a lot of of other Locksport lock sport members uh, publicize this between 2004 and 2006. It's kind of fallen behind lately because uh, once you learn it, it's kind of boring. It's not, a, it's not something that requires a lot of skill and practice like picking does. But when this happened, a lot of people, um, myself included, by the way, uh, kind of misrepresented the ability to detect bumping. And so everyone was like, well, what, what happens now with insurance if, if your lock was bumped because it doesn't look like you, like anything happened, it looks like you left a door open, so on and so forth. And in some cases, uh, that that may be a problem. Uh, a lot of insurance contracts, as I'm sure many of you know, are very, very tight, and they only cover a specific subset of, of different techniques, and so on and so forth. So maybe bumping wasn't included in uh, in your insurance policy. Um, it, again, we're going to find a lot of different uh, forensic evidence of this, more than most uh, all over all other. Techniques, in fact. Um, hold on. Harsh build. 
uh, we're going to find them in all these different areas, and they're really distinct when compared to all the different uh, types of entry. So the, the primary thing we're going to find is when you're bumping a lock, you're basically forcibly impacting those pins with the key. Uh, and the key has a lot of surface area, so it's going to make these nice big dents. And so wherever you bump the lock, you're going to be basically hitting this, and we're going to find nice big dents. Again, that doesn't look like lock picking, that doesn't look like pick guns, and it won't look like the other things we're going to go through. Uh, handmade keys are kind of an interesting thing. So uh, most people don't buy their bump keys uh, because they're morbidly overpriced. Uh, that's right, I said it. Um, but instead file their own because it's an easy thing to do, it's cheap, all you need is a, a key that fits the lock. Um, so what's kind of interesting about this situation is that when you file your key you're leaving a, a specific unique pattern on that key when you, when you file it. Any tool you make is going to have a specific pattern when you, you push it into something or make an impression with it. Now with the, with the bump key we might be able to uh, correlate the uniqueness of the key with the impact on the lock. Now, it's, a, it's an extremely hard thing to do. It's not something that's going to be um, done all the time uh, because mo in most cases, we just want to know that the lock was bumped. Uh, but of course, in criminal cases, we'll want to try and identify a suspect or be able to link a suspect back to a location or with a, a tool that they, they have. Uh, I like to use different lights, and, it, and it's a good thing to get into the habit of with forensics just to try and illuminate these different things. Uh, so here is a different type of light source. And you can see that the, the, the dents and the scratches are all pretty easy to identify. But again, same basic pattern. Uh, what's kind of cool and something I unfortunately don't have a lot of time to talk about is uh, the shape of the pins will, will, may cause unique things when you're bumping. So hold on. Yeah, I can't talk right now. Sorry. Sorry. I bet it's one of the people in the front row, in fact. Um, key bump, in, in this specific lock, both the tops and the bottoms of the bottom pins are rounded. And so what that means is you could insert them in either orientation to make uh, repinning the lock easier. But when these were bumped, what they're doing is basically impacting uh, very lightly the bottom of the top pin, and that's causing this, this strange deformity. Uh, when you bump, how many of you have bumped and it didn't work the first time? Everybody who's bumped, I'm sure. So when you do this, uh, what happens to all that kinetic energy you're trying to transfer? It doesn't just magically vanish. Uh, what usually ends up happening is that they don't jump correctly. Instead of jumping, you're basically slamming uh, the top pins against the chamber walls. And that's going to cause, uh, remember, because they're blocking you from turning at that position, they're going to slam into those walls and cause various dents. Uh, if we look at the last slide, we'll see that there's a, a gap between those two points, and that's called the serrated pin. If we look here, there's bumps so much that the serration closed up. And so it's kind of an interesting thing that this, this bumping uh, attempt uh, allowed this security mechanism to be slightly damaged. Now, we're still going to uh, have the same level of difficulty picking the lock, but it may cause a slight difference. It may make it easier. Uh, again, we talked about uh, the top pins are basically slamming into those chamber walls and over time what that's going to do is distort the chambers in, in almost any direction. So you can see here there's various distortions along the lip of the chamber in uh, various directions, right? The face of the lock, again we talked about what looks, what normal wear looks like right here. Uh, the face of the lock is going to have uh, a lot of wear from bumping. There are techniques to, to mitigate this uh, but most of the time when we bump, we don't do this, and we would still have uh, forensic evidence inside the lock anyways. So here's like the lock that I've taken to every conference I've ever been at where, where I've demonstrated bumping, and it's just, you can see it's really beat to hell. Here's a more moderate example of something that's only been bumped a few times, but again, it still doesn't look like normal wear. It's really, we, we definitely tell it something impacted that point. The plug itself, if you, if you look at your keys and your hands, you'll see that as you go towards the handle, the bow of the key, the materials start to get thicker, and that's so you can provide uh, strength so you don't snap your key when you turn it. When we do a, a technique called the minimal movement method, we're actually allowing that thick, thicker part of the key to enter the keyway, and the keyway is not shaped for that by default. It's only shaped to where the shoulder stops it. And so when we do this, we're actually displacing material from the front of the keyway because we're allowing that thicker portion of the key to go in. 
Uh, impressioning is kind of a cool T. Wow. I think I got all the vowels in that one. Uh, impressioning is kind of a cool technique that we demonstrated in the lockpicking village. I hope some of you got to see that, uh, where we basically use a blank key to manipulate the lock and make a working key for the lock and obviously open the lock with, with the working key. That's going to leave uh, uh, evidence because of the technique to do impressioning. So what we do when we impression is we insert the blank key and we apply very strong tension on the key itself, torque if you will, and we're going to rock the key back and forth. Remember, we're binding all these pins at the shear line, so they can't move. The blank key is going to pick up marks from us doing this, and from that we take it out, we file those positions, the key will drop slightly, the pins will drop slightly, eventually we're going to try and have all of the, the cuts on the key properly position the lock. And it's a very uh, easy thing to learn, uh, it's a hard thing to master, uh, but it is extremely effective, and it's great for locksmiths because they can open your lock as well as have a key that they could use to make you a new, brand new working key. So when we do this, when we apply this strong tension, we're basically shearing the pins forcibly into the plug and cylinder, and that's going to cause all these, uh, these shear points along the key, or excuse me, the pin. And what's kind of cool is that we could actually, for one, we could look and see how many times they sheared it, and as it drops down, we could see, well, maybe they... they filed this many times. We could also see the distance between those shears. And if they're really big distances, like in this photo here, we could say, well, maybe they knew exactly what lock it was, so they looked up the keying specifications so that they could make impressioning quicker. Because if you don't know how far each pin depth is supposed to go, you have to obviously go very slowly so you don't go too low. But if you know, you could just go directly, all right, this made a mark, we'll go to cut one. Made a mark again, we'll go to cut two. And it's a much quicker way to impression. And here we can see that they're very spaced out. So the person that did this probably knew uh, exactly what the king's specifications were. Uh, impressioning, again, we're, we're applying extreme tension to both sides of the plug. That's going to distort the plug chambers laterally. Uh, bumping can distort in almost any direction, any way, shape, or form. But impressioning is only going to go uh, to each side of the, the pin, pin chambers. Uh, we did some UV demonstrations in the, in the lock picking village of basically you can coat the blank with ultraviolet ink and the marks will be extremely easy to see. There's no guesswork involved. It's actually a really uh, easy thing to do and it's a lot of fun if you want to do this as a hobby. Uh, but all that UV ink is going to obviously rub off on the lock. And so we can see here in the keyway as well as on the shoulder uh, there's UV ink. Now. The pins themselves are also, of course, going to have UV ink on them. And if we look, we can actually see the, the positions where the, they rode the key. So as you're pulling it out, those are, those are the tracks of the UV ink rubbing off inside the lock. Decoding is kind of a, a hard technique to define only because lock picking opens the lock. Impressioning makes us a key. Uh, decoding doesn't necessarily do either of those. So what decoding is is that we gather information so that we have the, the information necessary to make a key. Doesn't necessarily make us a key right away. Uh, impressioning could be seen as a very obscure form of decoding where we're manipulating and we're decoding the positions of the lock. Uh, but decoding a, as a general technique is really hard to define. And so decoding is extremely powerful because a lot of methods are uh, surreptitious, which means we, we can't find any damning forensic evidence. So how many of you have a key on your belt or on your lap right now? No one wants to raise their hand? Okay, that, that gentleman. So uh, the person sitting next to him could very easily look at his key to look at the, the pattern of the cuts. And once you get really good at it, it's not very hard to determine the code of that key. So you can make your own. Not only that, I'm sorry, sir. You might want to put it away real quick. <laughs> um, not only that, but some keys have the code for each cut directly written on it. And with that, of course, we could go and make, make a, a working key. Uh, that would be an example of visual or optical decoding. There's also the over the shoulder. If we're using a combination lock, somebody could see you put in the combination, and they would know the combination. There's this idea of a decoder pick, which essentially leaves the same uh, evidence as a normal picking. But while you're picking it, it, you can see when you set the pin. And based on that, you could decode the, the depth of the pin and so on. Uh, there's this idea of, of combination manipulation with safes, which we talked about in the village again, uh, where, you know, like the spy movies where they, they jiggle the, the dial and listen to it with a stethoscope. Uh, that's not really how it works, but it is a, a very powerful technique. And since we're basically just using the combination lock normally, uh, we're not really 
doing anything that would leave forensic evidence. And uh, when I speak of forensic evidence, uh, the forensic locksmith isn't responsible for fingerprints or hair and fiber or so on and so forth. They're only responsible for forensic evidence as it relates to the lock or keying mechanisms themselves. Uh, so you could very well manipulate the safe dial and still leave your fingerprints, still leave uh, traces of your hair or maybe your skin cells, so on and so forth. Uh, but the forensic locksmith is only concerned with, with locks and keys. Now, when they disassemble it, they might find additional evidence, you know, such as hairs or blood or a lot of different things inside the lock that may help the investigators, but it's not their primary focus uh, for those things. There's also this idea of thermal uh, decoding where if we have a keypad combination lock, we can use thermal imaging to see the last buttons pressed based on the, the heat residue. There's uh, radiological attacks, which are basically taking x-rays of the lock to see where the components are or where they should be. Uh, again, we could disassemble locks and very easily determine all the components. That's something that, of course, you have to know how to do. It's, if I gave you guys a screwdriver and said, oh, I'll take apart that lock and put it back together completely, uh, maybe a lot of you could do it, but a lot of other people would, would have trouble, especially if it's a more complicated mechanism. There's a lot of little moving parts, so on. So visual decoding also goes into uh, looking at the components inside the lock itself, not just the key. So in this case, we have colored pins, and these are used in a, a lot of different uh, locksmithing kits or pin-it-yourself kits at Home Depot where you want to rekey your lock. So all you got to do is replace those pins and you match them up, the colors with numbers on your key or, or with whatever the locksmith gives you. Of course, we could use a bore scope or an autoscope or some kind of viewing device to look inside the lock, and if we could figure out all the colors and, and which pin set these came from, then we can make a working key for the lock. Uh, some locks, this is called a wafer lock, which is something we didn't talk about, but some locks you could actually look at the components themselves and they will sit at different positions, and from that you could decode their, their correct uh, the correct position uh, on the key. There's also, uh, again, disassembly and something that I've actually been interested in for the last couple months because I've been doing a lot of conference stuff is uh, hotel safes. Now, that may or may not be a hotel safe disassembled, or at least the lock on it. So w it doesn't even have to be a safe. It could just be the lock on the back door, a side door, an inner door. What if that safe lock is master keyed for all safes in the hotel? What if it's the, the room key is master keyed so that the, the janitor or the maid, whoever, can get in. That's obviously a huge problem. And w with disassembly, we could uh, take apart the lock and decode all the, the positions and then obviously have a key that works on at least one lock. Bypass is kind of a cool technique. So in, in lock picking, we're manipulating the components directly. Uh, bypass goes straight to trying to retract the bolt without affecting the integrity of the locking components. Does that make sense? Uh, this is how I define bypass. A lot of people consider bypass to be any technique that opens a lock, but I, I find it easier to, to segregate between the two. So with bypass, uh, the most common kind is uh, that cam piece in the back that actuates the bolt. In a lot of cases, that's unrestricted. You can move that uh, freely in, in really bad locks or even some well-designed locks that just happen to have overlooked this. So in this case, uh, you can see the scratches from a tool that was used. The American 700 is a story we like to tell a lot in a lot of the lock picking villages we give uh, about this lock. And it had this problem where you could just put in a thing in the back of the lock and turn and the, the lock would magically open. And it's kind of an interesting thing, but again, it leaves forensic evidence. So what ended up happening is that uh, this attack got to uh, American lock. And so they said, well, we'll design this little, uh, it's basically a piece of metal that fits in the back of the lock so that a tool can't go further and touch that component. And it has its own part number and everything. It's kind of a cool story. And so here's an example of, of tool traces of, a, of an attempt on that. Thank you. Um, and so <laughs> what happened after this, which I haven't included yet for, for time, uh, so somebody made the pick to do this. They made the, the little metal disc to prevent this. Somebody made basically a giant knife that you slam into the lock to break this component so that there's a nice hole so that you could again use that original tool. Uh, eventually this ended up, they redesigned the lock completely and, and discontinued the old one, I, I think. I'm not sure. I know there's a new, new design that they went with. Um, but it's kind of a cool story of, of you know, cat and mouse, and then eventually they ended up redesigning it to be much better um, due to this. So in the 11 o'clock talk, there was a lot of, a lot of discussion about uh, manufacturer response and how they improperly, in our opinion, uh, oh, I don't want to talk for everybody, but in my opinion, uh, improperly 
uh, deal with these security vulnerabilities, these security threats. So Mark Tobias uh, originally discovered a technique to bypass this uh, really expensive electronic lock uh, a couple years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Bobic of, of Tool US, uh, he knew that there was a bypass available. And this, this happened over the weekend at, at Black Hat. So th this is apparently O'Day material, but I want to credit those two for, for, for uh, figuring it out and letting me, letting me take pictures and, and do this. So what happened is that we're at the, the Black Hat for, uh, lock picking workshop, and we have this, this is a very expensive lock, a couple hundred dollars US. And so it's a combination lock. Obviously, it has a, an override mechanical cylinder that we could pick. But that's boring. Uh, Bobic noticed that there's this hole at the bottom. And what that is is the drain hole, because this is meant to be used on exterior doors. So we want to make sure that, that uh, water and, and moisture can drain out so that the components work correctly. So when Bobic took this apart, he noticed, hey, that's interesting. That drain hole goes directly to the, to the bolt actuator. And that's that piece right here. And so uh, Bobak figured out how to do this, and uh, he we were demonstrating it in that that class at Blackhead of hi, hi, him and Deviant Owen. Deviant Owen, he's going to kick my ass for that. Uh, demonstrated this, and so everybody in the class was like, "Hey, you're that forensics guy. Why don't you uh, why don't you figure that out?" <laughs> and uh, and so I took I took my camera and and I, I looked at it, and the first thing I noticed was that uh, there's all this material missing. And the way this bypass works is essentially a wire is placed between there and it picks up the actuator and allows the bolt to retract without entering a combination, without picking the lock. Uh, like Mark Tobias said, uh, there's still mechanical locks. And in this case, there'd obviously be no audit trail of when that happened because we're never interfacing with the electronic components of this lock. So in this case, uh, the, the placement of the wire when we rotate the bolt is scraping off all this material off to the side. And now, uh, obviously, I'm not CSI, so I couldn't do this during the week. But uh, that could be material from the tool he used. And, but in, for my money, I'm guessing it's probably material from that, that actuator position itself. More damning is that where the placement of the tool eventually finds itself, that, that piece on the end pushes in and allows the, the actuator to rotate. Uh, is tool marks, and obviously those are those are very distinct. The angle and pattern of them don't indicate normal use. So that that was that's our O day, and that's the forensic evidence. Uh, I hope you enjoy that because it was a last minute addition. Um, we have a uh, we have a lot of material to cover, which we'll we'll cover in 103, which is the Q and A room. Uh, I only have about five minutes left. So I'm going to go through, there, there's two more sections, but we'll go through them in Q&A if you guys are interested. Uh, I'm going to jump directly, I told you there's a lot, wait for it. Uh, all right, so a lot of people, uh, since I started the site about six months ago, uh, a lot of people have been asking me, well, how can, uh, how can I get certified or learn more about this? Uh, the, invest it <laughs> the International Association of Investigative Locksmiths offers licensing and certification. They also offer training, but all the people I've been referring to them come back to me and say they're not offering either. Uh, so as <laughs> Mark Tobias said, if you're a, a letter agency and you'd like training, I'd be happy to help you out. Um, again, contact them. Eventually, I assume they'll start uh, figuring out whatever they're doing and accepting new members or training and so on. Uh, I always hate it when people put a lot of links on the, on the last slide and everybody scrambles to write it down. So if you go to my site, lockpickingforensics.com, you could get all this information and a lot more. Um, you could also go to the links page for a lot of things you might be interested in. I also run the site called LockWiki, which is a collaborative uh, lock resource and reference. Uh, that has a lot of material. That also has a, a community portal with lots of other links, as well as links to various uh, lock sport groups, so on. Uh, that is all I have. I'd be happy to take questions in room 103. It's, it says track 4 Q&A. Thank you.